afternoon everyone and welcome to this month's lunch and learn uh, session for the London Centre for Work and Health. I'm Vaughan Parsons, the Centre Manager. I'm um, delighted to uh, introduce Brendan Dempsey. Um, Brendan is a research fellow based at University College London. Um, Brendan will be presenting findings from a literature review piece of work that he's in, been involved in uh, with regard to long COVID among NHS workers. Um, Brendan recently completed his PhD at the University College Dublin uh, in the School of Medicine. Uh, and his PhD project was focused on healthcare providers' experience, experiences with liberalised abortion care in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, so quite different to what Brendan will be um, presenting uh, today. So just encourage everyone to please put uh, microphones on mute and we'll take questions at the end of his presentation. So over to you, Brendan. Perfect. Thank you, Vaughan, for that introduction. Yeah, a little bit different uh, in terms of uh, what I did my PhD in, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Um, yeah, my name is Brendan MC. I'm a research fellow in ARC, um, the NIHR, um, ARC North Island is based in ACL, and I work um, on the NHS Check project. Um, and the work today is um, supported by the Cold Foundation. Um, so yeah, for an overview of the talk, um, I'll start first by introducing uh, long COVID, um, and then I'll move into the um, general body of research that has explored the symptoms and the prevalence of the risk factors associated with the condition. Um, and then I'll introduce the narrative literature review um, that I conducted and um, that explores the published literature around healthcare workers' experiences with long COVID. Um, and then I'll end by considering some of the key areas requiring future work um, in this field. Um, so, you know, just, I suppose, introduce, um, I'm sure there's no single person in the room that doesn't um, know about the COVID-19 pandemic um, or even in the world at this stage. But obviously, um, the emergence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, in late 2019 um, led to a pandemic. Um, we're all familiar with that. Um, and obviously, estimates suggest, um, and this is from the, our World and Data resource that is available online, um, that over 770 million diagnoses of COVID-19, um, the respiratory illness caused by the vaccine, um, have been confirmed to date across the world. Um, so although it's a large figure, um, potentially um, a huge underestimation and um, considering people that didn't get tested, people that were asymptomatic and also um, lower income countries that didn't have um, as robust a testing service um, as potentially we did here in Europe or in the US. Um, but clear um, that it was obviously a huge issue that um, affected the whole world. Um, and Common symptoms um, of the acute COVID-19 infection include, but obviously by no means limited to um, cough, um, fever, and also fatigue. Um, and it's important to note that while many people experience no symptoms, um, and some people only experience symptoms during that acute um, first two-week phase um, of the COVID-19 infection, um, other people report experiencing symptoms for weeks, months, um, or even years after they first become infected. Um, and really, this has led to kind of the first descriptions of long COVID. Um, and long COVID is the umbrella term that has been used to describe the complex medical condition um, whereby symptoms of COVID-19 persist or develop after that acute um, phase of the infection. Um, and to date, a lot of different organisations and, and bodies have proposed different guidelines on how to define long COVID. Um, but here in the UK, the National Institute for Health and Care experts um, have published their guidelines and that most likely were broadly used. And they differentiate between two kinds of long COVID. Um, the first, less severe long version, um, is ongoing symptomatic COVID-19, um, which is symptoms that are between four to 12 weeks after the acute infection. Um, and the latter is the more severe version um, of post-COVID-19 syndrome, um, or PCS. Um, and this is where symptoms um, develop or continue to develop um, 12 weeks or more after the acute infection. Um, and this second definition, um, PCS, um, aligns with other common definitions that are used in the um, research, the most, I suppose, prolific of which is the WHO definition of post-COVID-19 condition, um, which also specifies that symptoms should last for at least 12 weeks. Um, then kind of moving into the kind of growing body of literature, um, obviously since it was first described, um, there's been a huge interest in trying to explore and understand long COVID as best as possible. Um, and unfortunately, in the four years since it was first described, there's no agreed upon cause as to why some people experience long COVID. 
and um, to date there's been a number of theories that have been suggested and um, some certainly more plausible than others um, but none of them achieved any sort of scientific consensus um, or any kind of real support as to why um, some people experience long COVID. Um, to look at symptoms then, um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses of that growing body of literature that has explored long COVID um, has found that as many as 60 um, symptoms are widely prevalent in relation to long COVID. Um, and these include, but obviously are not limited to, fatigue, um, shortness of breath, um, loss of concentration, uh, memory loss, muscle pains, joint pains, change to or loss of smell um, and or taste, um, cough, headaches or migraines, uh, disordered sleep, chest pains, um, sore throat um, and also depression and anxiety. Um, and what I hope is obvious from that list is that it's incredibly broad and um, there's a huge variety of symptoms, um, 60 as I said, um, that are associated with long COVID. Um, and to date there's been none there's, I suppose there's been no um, consensus on what are defined symptoms that must be um, experienced for it to be long COVID. Um, and also many of these symptoms, um, such as fatigue, um, for example, um, may be prevalent within um, the general public anyway. Um, so it is quite difficult in how we define long COVID um, previously in terms of what time frames we use, but also um, in terms of what symptoms um, we specifically use to define it. And um, then kind of moving into prevalence rates and prevalence of long COVID um, meta analyses um, exploring um, long COVID um, have varied, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and specifically one um, meta analysis conducted by Woodrow et al um, found that studies that report um, long COVID and diagnose long COVID um, by self reported symptoms and um, predict significantly higher prevalences uh, compared to studies that diagnose COVID using healthcare records. Um, my memory of that study was that I think it was around 30, 40 percent um, prevalence um, if diagnosing long COVID by self-reported symptoms, um, whereas it was roughly around 10 to 15 percent prevalence um, if um, diagnosing uh, long COVID using healthcare records. And um, so clearly a big discrepancy um, in terms of uh, kind of the validity of, of prevalence rates. Um, prevalence if we um, use self-reported or healthcare records to define non-COVID. Um, and then using um, data from the um, Office of National Statistics here in the UK um, to kind of supplement um, the research, um, we can see that approximately 2 million people um, in the UK were experiencing self-reported uh, post-COVID-19 syndrome in the first two months of uh, 2023. Um, unfortunately, the ONS has not continued um, this particular um, these reports from the COVID-19 um, infection survey um, past the first two months of 2023, so it's impossible to know um, exactly how many people are currently um, suffering with um, or experiencing uh, PCS at the minute. Um, but this figure from the first two months of 2023 equates to roughly around 3% of the total population in the UK um, and also around 9% um, of all PCR uh, confirmed cases um, at the time. Um, so from this slide, we can roughly estimate that around 10% um, or 1 in 10 um, people who experience COVID-19 um, will go on to experience symptoms for three months or more. Um, as, as well, roughly around 3% of the population of the UK, we can see that this is an important disease that experienced by, or condition, should I say, that is experienced by a lot of people. Um, and also, while we don't know the risk factors, um, kind of research around general or we don't know the cause, um, research around risk factors um, conducted by studies that looked at the general public found um, that there are certain risk factors. Um, and the results of meta-analyses conducted by Santasi and Adal um, of 31 studies found that um, conducting kind of statistical tests across um, the different studies, that there are certain risk factors that are significant and should be um, explored um, for developing long COVID. Um, and these include being a female sex, uh, being older age, and also having a higher BMI, um, which were all associated with greater odds of reporting long COVID. Um, risk factors also included health factors, um, such as having a pre-existing medical condition prior to becoming infected with COVID-19, and um, particularly having a respiratory illness, such as asthma or COPD. Um, also having fewer than two doses of a COVID-19 vaccine um, was associated with and um, greater odds of developing long COVID um, and also being hospitalized during the um, acute COVID-19 infection um, or in general having a more severe um, infection. 
uh, during that, that first two weeks of the infection was um, associated with greater odds. Um, also, there's been kind of a growing smaller body um, that has explored and, and has found that poor mental health prior to um, COVID-19 infection is a risk factor for um, reporting um, uh, prolonged symptoms. Um, but this has been, I suppose, less um, investigated compared in comparison to the other uh, risk factors on this slide. Um, and then to move for the broader general public more into healthcare workers, um, we know that, health, that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had um, some uh, you know, unique kind of impacts on healthcare workers uh, that were working throughout. Um, and research again from the UK and um, from the Office of National Statistics um, has found that healthcare workers were among the occupational groups at highest risk um, to becoming infected by COVID-19 during the first year of the pandemic. And thankfully, this effect diminished um, after the first year, you know, likely due to increased access to PPE and also greater knowledge around transmission. Um, and also, ONS data has found that healthcare workers were at significantly higher risk um, in comparison to most of their occupational groups um, of prolonged COVID-19 symptoms um, and also at higher risk to death due to COVID-19 um, during that first year of the pandemic. And again, thankfully, that has um, dropped over um, and after that first year. Um, but due to their exposure to COVID-19 and increased risk of, um, first of all, catching COVID-19, then also experiencing prolonged symptoms and also um, you know, having a more serious uh, impact uh, due to the COVID-19 infection. Um, it is likely, at least in the UK at least, um, that healthcare workers um, are at high risk to long COVID, especially given statistics that one in 10 will go on to um, experience prolonged symptoms for 12 weeks or more. Um, and especially given um, the risk factors uh, that we know are associated with long COVID. Um, so to kind of explore this in more detail, we conducted a review um, of studies that looked at long COVID among samples of healthcare workers. Um, and just to give kind of a broad overview of the literature review, um, we conducted a narrative literature review, was the exact type of review that we conducted. Um, and we explored published English language original research articles um, looking at long COVID among samples of healthcare workers. Um, we searched for citations um, in, to be included in the review in five electronic databases. Um, and we also reviewed um, 4,121 unique citations that were identified in each of these um, electronic databases. Um, and the end of the, I suppose, review period, um, we included 31 articles within the first um, version of the literature review. Um, and these studies report on a total sample of 14,681 healthcare workers um, working in a total of 16 different countries. And as a note on the 31 articles that were included, um, most were quantitative, um, so 28 of them were quantitative. Um, there was two qualitative articles and then one mixed methods study. Um, and then also most of them were cross-sectional. Um, so 24 studies were cross-sectional, meaning that they only collected data at one time point, um, whereas the remaining seven were longitudinal. Um, collected data at multiple time points and follow healthcare workers across um, a period of time. Um, and while we present the results of the narrative literature review that we conducted, um, we also note that there's an ongoing meta-analysis um, by the UK REACH team who are based in Leicester. Um, and this will be using statistical tests to, I suppose, explore the prevalence of the risk factors of long COVID among healthcare workers in a little bit more detail um, in comparison to the narrative literature review that, that I'll present today. Um, the reference that I've cited um, by Amani uh, Al Arabi um, is the protocol for that systematic review and meta-analysis. It's available on the BMJ if anybody would like to um, access it. Um, and first, to kind of consider the prevalence and the symptoms of long COVID. Um, so the prevalence of post-COVID-19 syndrome, PCS, or that nice definition for um, symptoms for 12 or more weeks, and varied from a low of 12.8% um, to a high of 75.4% in the samples that were included within the review. And um, so huge variation in terms of um, how many people um, went on or became infected with COVID-19 and then went on to experience prolonged symptoms. Um, and really key point of this is that there's huge variation and huge um, variation in quality, especially in um, sampling and in these studies. Um, some of the studies had a huge bias um, in terms of how they picked their sample and who they included um, and really points to kind of low quality in a lot of the research um, as to how they 
uh, measure prevalence and how they um, objectively get um, figures to uh, identify how many people um, had COVID or long COVID. Um, then also in terms of the symptoms that were used, um, the most common symptoms um, were fatigue, which was studied in 24 um, of the included articles, and memory loss, difficulty concentrating, and was the second most common symptom, and that was measured in 12 studies. And um, shortness of breath was the third most common symptom, um, and that was measured in 20 studies. And um, loss or decrease of sense of smell and or taste was the fourth most common, and that was measured in 16 studies. Um, and then also joint aches and pains um, was the fifth most common, and that was measured in 12 studies. And um, so what's important here is that um, even though these were the five most common symptoms associated with long COVID across the studies, and none of them were examined in every single study. And, um, you know, we have huge variation in terms of which studies measure which symptoms, and this makes it very challenging. How do we directly compare um, prevalence rates or um, compare, you know, findings around post COVID syndrome if we're using different symptoms um, to define the condition and um, to measure the condition? And um, so certainly more work needed to um, standardize and kind of figure out what are the most important or symptoms associated with the condition and how can we um, be as consistent as possible in reporting the symptoms across the case. And um, then in terms of risk factors, um, evidence on the risk factors for long COVID in our narrative review is inconclusive. Um, and the big note here is many of the risk factors were found to be significant in certain studies. Um, however, none were consistent across all of the studies. Um, so, for example, you know, risk factors um, that fit this bill included being of older age, um, and this was a significant risk factor um, associated with higher odds of um, having a long COVID in eight of the 19 studies in which it was examined. Um, being female sex was significant in five of the 18 studies that it was examined in, um, and also having pre-existing illness was significant only in four of the 10 studies that it was examined in. Um, so huge variation in terms of um, whether or not risk factors are, are significant across the board. Um, and that is a challenge also um, in terms of, of you know, pooling the results and, and getting sort of objective um, comparisons between the studies. Um, and interestingly, despite that kind of emerging evidence um, that uh, it is an important risk factor, um, none of the studies included in our review explored if poor mental health prior to COVID-19 infection was a risk factor for COVID-19 or for long COVID even. Um, and it's important to, you know, take the evidence base to base, see what factors become important, and then to build models around always keeping in mind if certain factors appear important, that they should be included in that research to give um, the most uh, objective and, and um, full picture as possible. Um, additionally, as a note um, on the studies that were included in the review um, and also examined risk factors, um, most of these studies explored risk factors were cross-sectional. Again, meaning that they only collect the data at one time point. Um, for risk factor analysis, it would be ideal um, to collect all of the data um, for the risk factors prior to becoming infected with any of the um, whatever illness you're studying. Um, but um, for um, most of the studies included, um, all of the risk factors were collected at the same time that most people had um, already experienced long COVID for a number of months. And um, so certainly some bias estimate um within those calculations and um, then some of the studies also um explored impacts of long covid um, and the first of these studies and um, that i've pulled out for this example um, is that the majority of healthcare workers um who were experiencing um, post covid 19 syndrome and um, in a study from the uk so 69 percent of health workers and um, agreed with a statement um, that they were struggling to cope with their symptoms, um, specifically in terms of uh, maintaining a normal everyday life, in terms of um, maintaining their personal responsibilities, but also um, going to work. They said that they were struggling um, to cope with their new symptoms and, and how um, those symptoms affected their ability to undertake everyday activities. Um, in a second study, healthcare workers with PCS in a German study um, reported lower physical and mental health um, compared to their colleagues who also reported COVID-19 um, but did not um, experience prolonged symptoms. Um, so another clear impact of, of you know, lowered physical and mental health um, in comparison to um, colleagues that did not um, have to deal with I suppose, the challenges presented by symptoms or prolonged symptoms. Um, and also in a professional sense, um, 
research from Germany, Italy and Switzerland um, has found that healthcare workers with long COVID um, report reduced workability um, and also increased functional impairment uh, compared to colleagues um, who also had COVID-19 but did not experience prolonged symptoms. Um, so just some impacts um, of COVID-19 and some, I suppose, quantitative um, evidence of, of the impact that prolonged symptoms could have. Um, in addition, um, the literature review also highlighted some qualitative study um, that offered kind of a more insight and more in-depth um, view into healthcare workers' experiences of living and working at long COVID. Um, and this included two studies um, that were conducted with clinical healthcare workers in the UK. Um, as a caveat to these results, both studies were conducted um, within the first year of the pandemic. Um, so they're true to that time, but obviously, you know, four years on and four years um, since long COVID was first described, um, some of the results may be a little bit um, out of date, um, but it's still important to reflect on nonetheless. Um, but obviously, first, healthcare workers um, in both of these studies um, said that they used their own medical knowledge um, to diagnose their symptoms, um, fearing that there were signs of more serious illnesses, um, such as pulmonary embolism or myocarditis, were the examples given. Um, particularly, healthcare workers said that they used their own medical knowledge in absence of any sort of um, you know, broad knowledge at the time. Um, and this kind of feeds into the next point in that healthcare workers also use the professional networks um, to get advice and reassurance from their colleagues um, in the absence of those um, official guidelines or care pathways uh, published by the NHS. Um, additionally, healthcare workers said that they felt let down um, in that, particularly in that first year of the pandemic, um, given the lack of support um, that they experienced when trying to access um, healthcare services for their long COVID. Um, and they also called for dedicated long, care, long COVID healthcare services um, that could provide tailored support um, for people living with the condition. Um, and obviously, a um, great example of in the years since, um, these long COVID, um, dedicated long COVID healthcare services have become more popular. Um, and we would hope, um, you know, much more easier to access than, than uh, people um, initially had uh, issues dealing with and um, trying to access care. Um, and these have really been able to overcome the fragmented care that these early people um, experienced when trying to access support. Um, and additionally, many also said that their symptoms meant that they were unable to return to work. Um, and many also said that they felt um, you know, sharp disapproval from their colleagues and from their managers um, for taking time off. And um, particularly say, many said that they uh, felt that their managers and their colleagues felt that they were making up symptoms um, just to take time off. When in reality, um, you know, they were often unable to um, do anything other than, than lie in bed, um, especially at the at the peak of their um, difficulties with their prolonged symptoms. Um, so yeah, a lot of stigma around long COVID and, and um, feelings of disapproval that some people have experienced. Um, but that kind of is a broad overview um, of the literature review. Um, some kind of key points to note, um, which I hope have been clear enough in the presentation. Um, the first is that there's clear evidence um, that those affected by long COVID may experience significant personal and professional challenges due to prolonged symptoms. Um, you know, this you would hope is not in debate. Um, long COVID um, is prevalent um, with one in 10. There are certain risk factors associated that put people at greater risk than others. Um, and also, you know, the experience of these prolonged symptoms may have a significant impact. That is, is not a question and the research has been very clear in, in communicating that. Um, however, in terms of challenges and, and further work um, required for the field, um, there's a huge disparity in how long COVID is defined within the literature. Um, so first of all, um, as I said, there's a broad variety of symptoms that have been used to diagnose the condition. Um, and also there's different time frames used to diagnose the condition. Um, and these, you know, it would be ideal if we could converge um, on a specific set of symptoms or on a universal time frame that could be used. It would make comparisons much more um, standardized, much more objective, um, and would also help, you know, in our understanding and, and build up our understanding of um, the condition. Um, the second issue is obviously the lack of a scientific or consensus around the mechanism, um, or some people believe it's more likely the mechanisms um, that cause long COVID. Um, and specifically trying to identify and, and being able to identify what the biological mechanism that causes long COVID um, would help in developing treatments um, for the condition. 
Um, obviously, if we don't know what causes the condition, um, it can be quite hard to um, figure out exactly how to help people um, living with it or how to remedy that problem. Um, but in the kind of time since long COVID has been um, described, there's been a growing body of kind of research around um, treatments for the condition. And, and obviously, we hope that those continue and, and continue to, to um, show some uh, positive results. Um, and then finally, um, there's also a lack of high quality longitudinal data that explores healthcare workers' experiences um, with long COVID. Um, as I previously said, you know, while it would be um, preferable to have longitudinal data when exploring risk factors, um, access to longitudinal data would also help us um, follow up healthcare workers to know um, after a year how many people have recovered, how many people are still responding. Or reporting those um, long COVID symptoms um, and help us kind of figure out what's the prognosis for the condition, um, which can still um, at, at this point um, be quite um, unsure. Um, so, certainly, much more work to do um, within long COVID, um, but certainly more um, interesting findings um, available at the moment. Um, and that is my presentation. Um, thank you all for coming along and listening. And, and again, thank you. Uh, to the Cold Foundation who support the work. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Brendan. Can I just remind people to put themselves on mute, please, because we've got a little bit of background uh, noise coming through. OK, um, any questions from people in the group? We've got some hands up. Anne Ward. Hi, Anne. Hi, Brendan from Dublin. Hello. Um, Hello. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed two questions, but so the first one is I'm a psychiatrist, whether there's any way to help us discriminate presentations of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, which you see a lot of in people, some of whom have had COVID from post COVID. Yeah, I suppose my first point might be a caveat to that. Um, I'm not a clinician. Um, I'm a, a psychological researcher, so uh, some medical questions I, I, I probably won't have the skills or um, ability to answer. Um, again, I, I wouldn't be able to advise on how to discriminate in clinical practice between um, people with um, long COVID or, or other conditions. I don't know if anybody else in the... Yeah, Brendan, I was going to suggest we've got a, uh, some um, clinicians in the group. Yeah. Uh, in this session, just wondering if one of our clinical colleagues might be able to address that point that Anne was raising. Just while we're waiting for someone, so I've got some hand up. Ira. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank, thanks, Anne. I mean, I, I can try and answer that. It's difficult is the, is the answer. So it's really the history um, of the, the COVID infection and the um, symptoms developing following that infection that distinguishes from um, chronic fatigue syndrome. But there's a huge overlap between symptoms in chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia and, and, and long COVID. But it's history. Thank you. That is actually really helpful. Uh, the other question is um, that there, there are specific strange syndromes that are emerging post COVID. And for example, I have a friend who was diagnosed with atypical Guillain-Barre and hypothyroidism. And because she was attending a specialist clinic, it was picked up and she was told that was a recognizable um, post COVID presentation. And I'm just wondering how, you know, how much is known about these more syndromic things where you can actually f identify physical problems, like a very low thyroid, for example, thyroid level. Again, yeah. I might see one of our clinical colleagues yeah. pick that question up. Back to Ira. Yeah, sorry, unless any of the other clinicians on the call know, um, I'm not aware of that association but i i seriously haven't kept up with the there's a huge amount of literature out there um but some somebody else might know yeah joe joe's got a hand up there hi hi i'm a respiratory doctor and, and not seeing many people fortunately with with this but just anecdotally if somebody comes in with symptoms that might be following on from post 
from from COVID and they're reporting fatigue, we would ordinarily do a thyroid function test as part of the assessment. And anecdotally, we have picked up some people with low low thyroid function, as have people who are running long COVID clinics. But I I don't really know how common it is, um, and and what the instance is amongst uh, amongst people with the syndrome. Okay, thank you both very much. Thank you. And we have a question here from Paul Cullinan in the chat box. Have there been or are there any high quality therapeutic trials in long COVID that you're aware of, Brendan? Yeah, to date, I'm not. I'm actually just having a Google of it there. Um, I'm not familiar. Um, there is a locomotion study. Um, sorry, it's been a while since I've looked at it. Um, yeah, so there's the locomotion study is the ongoing. Um, I can send in a link to it now, but it's the Long COVID Multidisciplinary Consortium for optimizing treatments and services across the H, uh, the NHS. Um, and that has had some work um, in terms of, I think it's an ongoing project, but it's 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 done some work in terms of um, looking at uh, treatments available for um, the treatment of long COVID. Here okay. you. Yeah, so that's um, that's Trish Greenhall's study, um, Paul, and it's a big NIHR funded study, and she's got looking at very at looking at a lot of different interventions and, and that's the only one in the UK that I'm aware of. Alrighty, Brendan, thank you very much for a very thorough and comprehensive uh, presentation describing some of the key points from the literature, yeah. if you like, with regard to long COVID presentation in healthcare workers. Thank you. We have so we've got a question here from Kathleen Lynn, who's one of our consultants in occupational health at Guy's and St Thomas's. Is there any data on the duration of long COVID? For example, how many are still functionally impacted after six months, one year, etc.? Yeah, so that's again kind of a huge issue and um, within the review that I kind of did is that a lot of the studies are cross-sectional and they don't follow people up. Um, over time. So the majority of the data is taken at um, three months or six months. And again, it's difficult to know what the exact prognosis is with cross-sectional data. We don't have the data to follow people up. Um, I don't know, Ira, if you have. Um, uh, no, I, no, I don't know any, any more than that. I think there's, so, so just, um, Brendan, there's another question to say, yes. just so that I'm sure that, not sure that I understand that your review was done in 2021. You did it last year, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, early 2023. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. So, so yeah, sorry, I don't know. I don't know the question that Kathleen's put. And again, if anybody else does, please pipe up. And also, Brendan, presumably you're going to present the results of um, the work that you've been doing on the longitudinal data at a, diff at a separate session. Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, Later in the year, absolutely. Yeah, we can we can present um, findings from the NHS check work that we've done. Yeah, yeah, great. Sorry, Brendan, I've got another question from Kathleen. Also, any studies that tell us proportion of healthcare workers with long COVID off work and need yeah, adjustments? Again, a lot of work is needed yeah. in this field. It's one of the um, studies we have in the NHS check cohort. We're looking at sickness absence, and um, but there hasn't been a lot of of. Um, I suppose larger studies um, looking at percentage of healthcare workers with long COVID. Um, to memory, there was some um, news articles, but I don't know if they were informed by um, just reports given to them by um, occupation groups or, or, you know, I'm not sure how that the figures were informed, but there were some news articles um, to memory a couple of months ago um, about um, thousands of healthcare workers still off work. But, um, you know, I can't speak to the validity of those claims or those figures. Okay. We have got that data, we just haven't analysed it. So, yeah. I had a question, Brendan. You mentioned briefly about long COVID um, clinics that have been set up in the NHS to support healthcare workers. Yeah. Do you know what um, what type of therapeutic support they're able to offer to healthcare workers? Um, again, Did you, have you no. pick up any of this? So, the review didn't pick up anything from the UK, okay. no. Um, again, my understanding is that the, the services are kind of based on a one by one and um, that people are, are I suppose given services based on on their presentation 
Um, but again, I, I wouldn't be able to give further uh, information on that, unfortunately. OK, no worries. And I thought I saw Joe Yarka had a hand up. Hi, sorry, I came um, very late, so I missed most of your presentation, unfortunately, Brendan. But I was just um, to the point about data um, available for the long term. Sorry, how many people do um, remain impacted? There's only the stuff that I've come across has been the ONS data, but it's not healthcare specific. But I can mm -hmm. post that in the chat. But also, I was wondering if there was anything from the TUC study. So they looked at um, self-report length of um, condition, and so there might be something in there. Yeah, um, I'm not incredibly familiar with the TUC. Um, again, that that would be a great resource to look into a little bit more um, in depth. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar with those particular results from the TUC. But, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And I've just got a final question from Sally. She's just uh, querying uh, if there are any links to the funding that was made available for supporting long term absence for long COVID. I'm not quite sure what that question's asking. So my understanding, I, d I don't know, Sally, are you talking about the um, the special payment? Um, that was for NHS staff um, suffering with long COVID. Yes, because I was yeah. working in the ambulance service at the time and it made a big difference because people were able to be moved to um, much lesser duties. Some of them were on support vehicles and making tea and coffee for their colleagues, which they could just about manage when they couldn't do anything else. And then it disappeared again. And I just wondered if there were any, if there was any sight of that because they're yeah. allowed them to work on very, very restricted duties and feel purposeful, which we know is really important. Yeah. I just wondered if it if it turned up in anything. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, unfortunately, no. Um, I suppose research around that at the minute. Um, we're trying to, I suppose, build up some um, research. Obviously, the um, payment was started to remove. I think was it the people returned to their normal contracts in September 2022, which gave them six months of. Uh, up to six months of full-time pay and then um, another six months of, of half-time pay and um, but there's been no um, research to my knowledge um Anne, do you yeah there was a bmj publication before christmas looking at increasing suicidal ideation in healthcare workers during the pandemic and as far as i remember there wasn't any attempt to link that to illness i think that would be a very important thing to do because of the disbelief that people have written about meeting you know, in their colleagues that they, they're in addition to the symptoms they're faced with, oh, for God's sake, pull yourself together kind of response, which can't help. Of course, yeah. Um, Ira? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sally. The um, Danny Lamb is leading a grant proposal, one of the uh, uh, looking at some of the interventions that were put in place in uh, during and post COVID uh, and the effect on mental health and well-being and staff retention and one of those is that long COVID payment and and linking it with uh, ESR to see if see what the impact was so so watch the space but nothing about it coming back I don't think I think that's it I think it's gone all right well thank you very much everyone uh Brendan thank you once again Thank you for your presentation. And we have Joe Fieri from Imperial who will be running next month's session looking at firefighters and respiratory health. That'll take place on the 6th of February. So look forward to seeing many, if not all of you next month. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.